Welcome to Success Story, the most useful podcast in the world. I'm your host, Scott D. Clary. The Success Story podcast is part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network, as well as the HubSpot Podcast Network. Now, the HubSpot Podcast Network has other incredible podcasts, like the Salesman Podcast, hosted by Will Barrett. Now, if you work in sales, or you want to learn how to sell, or peek at the latest in sales news, check out the Salesman Podcast, where host Will Barron helps sales professionals learn how to find buyers and win big business in effective and ethical ways. Now, if some of these topics resonate with you, you're going to love the Salesman Podcast. The psychology of the perfect cold call, uh, successful cold email trends for 2022, the four-step process to influencing buying decisions, or the digital sales room, the future of B2B sales. If these topics hit home, you're going to love the Salesman Podcast. Listen to the Salesman Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Today, my guest is Stephen M. R. Covey. He is a New York Times and number one Wall Street Journal bestselling author of The Speed of Trust, The One Thing That Changes Everything, as well as he is the author of the brand new book, Trust and Inspire, How Truly Great Leaders Unleash Greatness in Others. He is the former CEO of Covey Leadership Center, which under his stewardship became the largest leadership development company in the world. Stephen personally led the strategy that propelled his father's book, Dr. Stephen R. Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People to Become One of the Most Influential Business Books of the 20th Century, according to CEO Magazine, as well as according to the fact that millions of copies have been sold globally in multiple languages. Now, what do we speak about today? Well, since uh, he has taken on the mantle, he's become CEO of the Franklin Covey organization, and he's grown the organization to the extent and the uh, the influence that it has today. He is focused on additional leadership qualities that help create successful organizations, leadership qualities that he has pulled out from his own experience, as well as some of the incredible companies that Franklin Covey has worked with, many Fortune 500, many Fortune 100, Fortune 1000, as all the way to startup. He's worked with a ton, and we spoke about the main things that impact organizations. We spoke about trust and inspiration and how, as a leader of a person or a team or an organization, you have to focus on unlocking trust and inspiration in your team. So we spoke about how to build a culture of trust and inspiration, what a high trust culture looks like. We spoke about how to hire the right people. So we're great at hiring for competency, but how do we hire for all the other things that allow that person to be successful and to contribute to a culture, a high trust culture, a high inspiration culture. We spoke about how the traditional command and control model of leadership is no longer a viable leadership strategy, even though 90% of organizations still use this type of leadership strategy. We spoke about uh, the importance of modeling high EQ, uh, high self-awareness within an organization. And then because he's worked with some of the most exceptional businesses in the world, he brought out some case studies and examples of businesses that are building high trust, high inspiration, and highly effective and profitable businesses. So let's jump right into it. This is Stephen M. R. Covey. He is the CEO of the Covey Leadership Organization, as well as a multiple best-selling author. I think back of about about when I was getting out of business school, just gotten on my MBA, and I had a couple of different opportunities as to, I think back of about, about when I was getting out of business school, just gotten on my MBA, and I had a couple of different opportunities as to, you know, what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go, and, and um, one was uh, to work on Wall Street. I'd done that in the prior summer, and, and uh, very exciting, uh, you know, had a summer job in between years of business school, got offered to go full-time, and that was really enticing because Wall Street was so exciting, big deals and stuff like that. So that was one opportunity. Another was with the company I'd been with prior, Trammell Crow Company, which was in real estate development. Great national real estate developer building big office buildings and and um, doing it all around the, the country. Very exciting work building these buildings and 
And um, I had done that before business school, really liked it a lot and, and had done well. And so that was enticing. So kind of these two mainstream exciting opportunities, one on Wall Street, one real estate development. And then another was to join with my father and a little teeny company <laughs> at the time called Stephen R. Covey and Associates. It became the Covey Leadership Center. And um, but didn't have very many people, was kind of small, and uh, just starting up. <clears throat> and and um, so I kind of debating, and, and, you know, to any outsider looking at this, it's kind of like, what, I don't understand. What's your decision point? You know, I, I clearly roll out, roll out this last one. That's just a little, that's with your dad, a little small company, but you got this big Wall Street opportunity, this big real estate one, and, and um, <clears throat> I remember going back and forth, back and forth, and finally, I, I'd kind of narrow it down to between the going back to Trammell Crow Company, the real estate development, or doing this with uh, the uh, Covey Leadership Center, and and um, which was maybe I think what 15, 20 people at the time, <laughs> and and um, <clears throat> and I remember it came down to thinking about this, and and uh, and I was a little reluctant to join up, um, you know, with my father, kind of wanting to go out on my own, do my own thing, prove my own worth type of thing. But at the same time, I was intrigued because my father had yet to launch a new book that I knew was coming out called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And I thought, this is going to be big. I'd seen it connect with people. I knew it was going to work. And I thought, this could have a real impact on a lot of people. And that was yet to happen. And I thought I could be a part of this and could help guide it. And, and, um, but I still was debating, you know, this other is more mainstream, more exciting in terms of, of, you know, prestige and the like. And then uh, my father asked me a question. He said, okay, Stephen, you, you go wherever you want to go, but here's my question for you. Do you want to build buildings or do you want to build people? And, and that was ex an exciting framing to me because, I liked building buildings. I thought what we were doing was really exciting. But the idea of building people was really what was deep in my heart and soul. It was developing people, developing people, developing leaders. And I said, you know what? I think I want to develop people and develop leaders, which for me represented kind of my why. Now, there's nothing wrong with developing buildings and building buildings because that's also can be a very valuable thing. It just wasn't my highest sense of contribution and purpose and meaning. So I said, you know what I do? I want to build uh, people. So I went down that path. And and a long story made short is uh, uh, six months after joining, we launched the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People book. And that really kind of just um, took off. And, and, yeah. then the, and the business took off. And the Covey Leadership Center really got established not only in the United States, but all around the world. And today is, as Franklin Covey operates in 150 countries around the world, leadership development and among the largest in the, in the world at what we do. And, and so uh, it was kind of an exciting um, moment in time in which uh, um, I kind of got a sense of what really was my why and my purpose. And I was not as clear about it then as I am now, but the idea of Building people is really what intrigued me, and, and it tapped into a sense of a purpose and meaning and contribution. So I went down that path, and and then along the way, found a lot of other things that I wanted to say, including my message on trust, and now this idea of trust and inspire, mm -hmm. and and really the whole idea of trying to bring out the best in others. So that's kind of a, a roundabout way of getting to where I ended up on the path that I am. I'm on, you know, focusing on right now leadership yeah. development. And, you know, with this new book, Trust and Inspire, How Truly Great Leaders Unleash Greatness in Others. That was the, that was the initial starting point, deciding oh, I, okay. to build people. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and I think it's interesting that you, you chose that path, and I'm happy that you did, because now you look where the organization has, has come to and what it's achieved. Um, now, I'm going to ask a quick question about the history, then we're going to go into the future. So first, it, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Why has that book and those lessons remained so influential? How has that sort of transcended all the different change, the disruption, the change in how we work, the change in how we 
uh, hire and train and onboard and the t even like the personal change in what we hold dear because this book was this book was when was this book released? Uh, 1989. 89. So now yeah. we're 2022. And it is still it's still it's on my shelf. It was the first book that was given to me uh, by one of my CEOs when I joined a company. So why do you think it stayed so influential and remains so influential? I think there's several reasons. I'll just highlight three of them. First, I think it's because it's focused on principles that are timeless, that endure, as opposed to just practices or or techniques that you know might ebb and flow and go in and out with different times. Now, these are enduring principles of effectiveness that worked in 1989, that work in 2022, and it will work in 21, 30, 22, I believe, because they're fundamental principles of effectiveness, integrity and fairness and, and um, trust and, and um, enduring principles, you know, service, contribution, these types of things. So that's the first reason. A second is because Seven Habits is really about moving from the inside out as opposed to kind of saying, well, the problem is out there. It's everybody else. It's saying, what can I do? Let's look in the mirror. I'll work from the inside out and take responsibility and own it. And that is empowering to everybody. No matter where we stand, there's, there's, we can do things in our circle of influence and have that grow and expand. And so that's, it's so self-empowering to people of, you know, of how they can engage in these principles and take responsibility for themselves, for their lives. And, and that gives you a sense of, of clarity and power in a world of change and disruption. And people want and seek that, to have a sense of, here's what I can do within my circle in, of influence and enlarge that. And I think that that is self-empowering. And finally, I think that I liked how um, Jim Collins put it, the author of Good to Great. He wrote a foreword for my dad's book, um, that is, is being used today. And in it, he said, he talked about how, how the internet really was created in the late 60s, but didn't really gain popularity or usage until you know, the mid 90s. And, and the, because it was so complex and so cumbersome. And it wasn't until there was a user interface, a browser, that happened with Netscape and others in the in the 90s that made this that made the internet accessible, usable because it needed a user interface. And then he said um, that these principles of effectiveness have been out there for you know for centuries. But what my father did in the Seven Habits was create the equivalent of a of a human effectiveness user interface. <laughs> A browser that brought them together, together and made them accessible, practical, tangible, actionable, that we could get our arms around of these universal principles that were existing for a long time. He didn't create the principles. He just created a user interface of human effectiveness that made this accessible. And that's what the seven habits is. And I, I think it's a good analogy for why it's so useful and so practical. The idea that, you know, private victories precede public victories and and you know, be proactive, begin with the end of mind, put first things first, just a really practical way of applying and implementing these universal principles that have been out there. And so that's the idea behind the seven habits. And I think it's really one of the main reasons why it's so useful and valuable to people even today. And I think it will be 30 years from now and 100 years from now as well. So as we, we obviously know that this book has become almost like a, like a Bible for people that are going to business and going to leadership and trying to upskill um, and level up themselves. So your dad did some really incredible work. Now, you come into the organization. You're trying to carve your own path. I'm sure that's uh, a little bit daunting, to say the least, because you know the, the name, you know the, the book that's been put out, that's been purchased millions and millions of times, translated into different languages. So now you're trying to carve your own path in the Frank and Covey Association and organization. So these habits are effective for people and in leadership positions or not in leadership positions, even though one could argue that every position should be some sort of leadership position, whether or not you're managing a team or managing your peers. But when you look to teach and, and, and inspire and give over new insight to the next generation of leaders, 
how did you carve your path? How did you figure out what more you could add on? What hasn't been taught yet or what could be added onto or taught even better? Because that's what you've been doing over the past. I don't, I don't want to put a number on it because I don't want to age you, but yeah. you've been doing it for a considerable amount of time. So where did you choose to go? What did you choose to develop and learn and explore? And this is obviously what you're taking to the world now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me tell you how it happened. It, I, I, I see that I've had two major career acts. And the first act was when I joined, I focused on helping build the Covey Leadership Center, build my father's work. And Scott, almost by choice and by design, I felt like I'm going to focus on the business side of this. And I'm going to try to help build this company into a, a sustainable business, an enduring business, and go from, you know, Stephen R. Covey, the man, into Covey Leadership Center, the firm, the company, and become bigger than just my dad so that, so that it could outlive my dad and, and, and could do all kinds of things and influence people all around the world. And we had to create a business model. And I felt like with my MBA and my business orientation and mindset that I could be a real contributor to doing that. So I became our CEO and we had to figure out a business model. You know, we had a good value proposition that, so we were growing, but we hadn't figured out a good business model yet to make sure it was profitable growth and we, it was sustainable. And we had to kind of work through that. And I feel like that, that's where I can make a contribution. And also, candidly, Scott, I was a little bit, it was daunting having my father's name and, um, you know, Stephen M. R. Covey, um, he's Stephen R. Covey, just, a, just one different middle initial. <laughs> and, and, um, and I felt like no matter what I do, it's not going to measure up to what he could do. So I felt safer to say, I'll go down the business path. But in fairness to me, I also felt I had unique gifts and competencies that could contribute well to the business side of this and that the company really needed the business side. So I went down that path. And, and that was the first half of my career, act one, if you will. And we did really well, and we turned this into a business that became a global business, and we became very profitable, and we began to impact people and organizations all around the world. Then we did a merger with Franklin Quest. This is the former Covey Leadership Center, merging with Franklin Quest to form Franklin Covey. And it was coming out of that merger as we, you know, like any merger, we had our ups and downs and struggles and, and that because we had been arch competitors now coming together and we had to figure out how to do it. We did. It took a little bit of time, but we figured it out. And, and I realized in this process the importance of trust, how trust changed everything. When we first merged, we didn't trust each other. We're kind of two separate companies with different, you know, different vantage points, viewpoints coming in. Because we'd been competitors, we didn't have trust. And I saw how everything slowed down, took longer, cost more, got politicized. And then we became aware of this, that we're not achieving our potential because we don't trust each other fully. We began to work on this. We began to behave our way into greater trust. We built it intentionally, on purpose. We worked at it. We built high trust. Suddenly, we could do everything better, faster, more creativity, more innovation, more engagement, more commitment. Everything went up and I saw firsthand the high the high return of high trust as I, as I had seen the high cost of low trust prior in the first part of the merger and I came out of this so inspired around the idea that trust matters it changes everything trust is learnable movable because we just moved from low trust to high trust and that that this was a real area of contribution that I could um, create. And I suddenly felt like I found what I want to say. And I think all the business background that I'd done from my first act gave me credibility to go into the second act of saying the highest leverage thing a, a leader can do is to build a high trust team and a high trust culture because of how that changes everything. And I've learned how to do it. And we've learned how to do it. And we can help others do the same. And that became what my really is, I feel like my life's work, what I'm doing now, the importance of building high trust teams, high trust cultures as a true differentiator and competitive advantage for any organization and for any leader. And so I came out with my book, The Speed of Trust, the one thing that changes everything. And now with this new book, Trust and Inspire, how truly great leaders unleash greatness in others through building high trust teams and high trust cultures and by inspiring 
people. And so I found my voice in the very act of kind of leading the business. And, and then once I found that, I didn't worry or care about comparison with my father because I was proud of my father. I was delighted to be part of his legacy. I felt a sense of stewardship and responsibility. And, and um, once I found my voice around trust, I felt like I'm going to just do this and not worry about, about uh, um, anything, you know, being a poor man's version of my father because that didn't matter to me. I felt like I found something of value to say that could make a difference in the lives of leaders and of organizations. And so I've gone down that path and it's been, this is act two and, and it's been exciting. And, and I, I feel like uh, I've made a real difference in the contribution. At least I hope that I have Scott. And I think that I, 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 I know I was going to say, I think that what you're trying to solve for are the most difficult things to solve for in leadership. And if we look at, one of the points that you make, you've spoken about it on past, past podcasts in your book as well, we're migrating from this traditional command and control model, which actually, it's unfortunate, but when you're in a command and control model, you don't actually need a ton of trust because people are just, you say, do this, and they say yes. And you say, do that, they say yes. So there, maybe internally they don't trust your decisions, but ultimately they're still going to do what you're telling them to do, which is not, again... This is not a sustainable business model. We see it more and more. So if we look at the future of, well, first, I'd actually just like to get your opinion on where leadership actually lies right now to date. In 2022, what are the observations that you see about businesses? Do you still see businesses trying to succeed with a traditional command and control model? Or do you see that being um, a business strategy and a leadership strategy that is is going away very quickly? Both. It's still... In spite of all our progress, we are still trapped a bit in the old command and control model. We become better at it, though, more sophisticated, more advanced. I call it enlightened command and control. <laughs> so it's a lot better version of it. But still, we're deeply scripted in our mindset, in our paradigm, that we too often still treat people like things, just a more sophisticated, advanced, enlightened version of it. So I call it enlightened command and control. And the data shows that still about nine out of 10 organizations are still in some version of enlightened command and control or some version of command and control. But to your point, and you reference this, they're recognizing that it's not working anymore. And it's certainly not going to work with um, this new generation of workers of, of uh, you know, Gen Z. And it's not working very well with millennials. And, and, um, and, and that, that this new world of work <laughs> requires a new way to lead. And the old model, the old command and control isn't going to work. That, like you said, that, that's operating not on trust, but on, on fear and on, on, on position. And you know what? People have choices and options today. And people want a sense of meaning and purpose and contribution. When they want to matter. People want to be trusted. They want to be inspired. And the old model... Even the enlightened version of it, command and control, doesn't inspire. You don't build high-trust cultures that inspire people through command and control. You can't collaborate and innovate through command and control. So we need a new way to lead in a new world. And I call it trust and inspire. And so I think that is the future of leadership. I think we are moving from command and control to trust and inspire. And we're in that process of moving. And I think we're further along in our in what we're saying and in what we're doing. We're saying we need to move to the equivalent of trust and inspire, but our practices and our systems and our structures are still too much caught in the old model of, of command and control. But we're recognizing for the first time this is not working very well, and it hasn't for some time, and we need to shift. So we need to, we need to become equally clear, not only where we're moving from command and control, but where we're moving toward. And I'm calling it trust and inspire. You model, you trust, you inspire. That is the new way to lead in our new world. It's what Satya Nadella has done at Microsoft. It's, you know, he came in and instilled a growth mindset. He modeled, he trusted, he inspired. And, and, and um, they call it modeling, coaching, caring. And they moved, they, they really revitalized the organization at a time when, you know, they still were big, but they were becoming less relevant, less innovative, less impactful. 
and revitalize the organization through his leadership style. You know what Cheryl Batchelder did at Popeyes to completely revitalize the organization through leadership style, unleashing the greatness, the potential inside of people through the style of leadership that saw the greatness inside of people and unleashed it. And that's the kind of leadership that's needed today. And that's where we're going. It's where we need to go. But you know what? We're still in that process of getting there. And we, we need examples, men, models and mentors of leaders that can help us do this. And we need to become those kind of leaders to help us get there. I just want to take a second and thank the sponsor of today's episode, HubSpot. Now, pies, taking candy from babies, both things that are theoretically easy. But anyone who's made a pie from scratch or attempted to pry a lollipop from a screaming toddler knows these things are, in fact, very difficult. But you know what is easy? Integrating, automating, and scaling your business with HubSpot. Now, the HubSpot CRM platform seamlessly transfers customer data into usable insights, like what's the average time it takes us to respond to a customer service request, or how can we get better at it? The HubSpot Service Hub brings all your data and support channels in one place, so your team can spend less time hunting for information and more time delighting customers. Plus, seamless connectivity with marketing and sales hubs means every person on your team has a crystal clear picture of your customer. Easy as HubSpot. Learn how HubSpot can make it easier for your business to grow at HubSpot.com. It's interesting because I think that you actually unlock something that's very important. You don't just have a high trust culture because a high trust culture is great. That means that you trust people to do the thing that's going to move the business in the right direction. But if those people aren't inspired, you can trust them all day long, and then they're probably not going to be doing the thing that's going to actually get the business to the next level if they don't feel inspired, if they don't feel some purpose for what their work is. They're never going to be giving the 110% that you would need from that person and that you would try and get them in a command and control. So if people just think, I'm going to trust, I'm going to trust that everybody does the right thing, but you have people that are completely disenchanted with the actual thought of showing up every single day and doing the thing that they're going to do, the, the trust model falls flat. So it can't just be trust alone because trust alone, people are going to be like, well, he trusts, she trusts me to do whatever I want to do. I'm going to apply for another job in my free time because I, I don't like my work. Or I'm going to start a side hustle that's going to take up most of my day because I don't really care about what I'm doing in my nine to five. So you have to have the inspiration. But that's such a difficult thing to wrap your mind around. Like, how do I? Because you always say that, oh, you know, you want all your employees to feel like they're owners. I mean, you can give out some equity. You can maybe give them some options. But like, it's very difficult to inspire somebody at the same level as the founder, CEO, people that own the business. So how do you do this? <laughs> how do you yeah. actually do this? <laughs> yeah, well, I love how you framed it, Scott, because you're exactly right that the high trust culture is half of it. The high trust culture that inspires, that inspiration is the other half. And, and you need both halves in our world today to differentiate, to make a difference, to, to be the kind of organization and place where people feel like they can, where they're trusted and the work they do matters and makes a difference and they want to make a difference. And so how do you inspire? Well, first of all, let me say this, that I think you've identified, um, you know, to use the, the Wayne Gretzky metaphor where he was asked, what makes you so great at hockey? And he says, I skate to where the puck is going to be. Not to where it's been, but where, to where it's going to be. I think in leadership, the puck, so to speak, where, where things are going is towards inspiration. Inspiration. And, and um, I think inspiration is actually the new engagement, the next frontier of engagement. We've been focused on engagement for the last 20 years, and it's a good thing. I'm not going to downplay engagement. It's vital to engage people so that they have that discretionary effort that they're giving. That's a good thing. We need to continue to move towards engagement. But I think there's another frontier another level that's inspiration, even beyond engagement. And there's actually a study from Bain and Company that shows that inspired employees are, yes, 125% more productive than merely satisfied employees. Now, you might expect that, you know, satisfied yeah. is not enough, but they're even 56% more productive than engaged employees. 
So there's another frontier level that we can reach when people feel inspired. And inspiration, to inspire comes from the Latin term inspirare. It means to breathe life into. So you breathe life into relationships, into teams, and organizations, into culture. You light the fire that's within people. It's internal. It's intrinsic. It's inside of them. See, motivation is external. It's extrinsic. So you motivate people with carrot and stick. That's, that can come out of command and control. And it's not a bad thing per se. It's just that you're trying to move people through carrots, through sticks, to try to move people to do things. Inspiration is internal. It's intrinsic. It's inside of people. You're trying to light the fire within and let that fire burn. And, you know, it doesn't need constant um, new, new incentives, new stimuli thrown at it. It can live on. And if you can ignite that fire that's inside of people, that can burn on for years. And, and um, that's a higher level that we're trying to achieve to tap into the desire for purpose, for meaning, for contribution. I think that's where things are going towards inspiration, to be inspired, to have that fire lit within. I'll give you an example of this. Um, I, was, uh, I went and worked with uh, the Pepperdine University, beautiful university um, in Southern California. And um, here's their, I worked with uh, Jim Gash, their president and their cabinet and their team. Listen to the, the School of Business there, the Graziato School of Business. They establish a purpose that people really feel a sense of connection to that inspires them. And they, and they, and they phrase it this way, that, that our purpose is not to develop leaders who are best in the world. Our purpose is to develop leaders who are best for the world. You know, best for the world leaders. Now, to be best for the world, you've got to also be pretty good in the world, too. You know, yeah. so, you, you know, so it's not saying it's not either or, it's an and. But the overarching purpose is contribution, to make a difference, to matter, best for the world leaders. And imagine what that does to inspire the, the professors, the, fa- the staff, the janitor, anyone working there feels like I'm part of developing best for the world leaders. And, and tapping into that sense of purpose and meaning and contribution. That's what we want to do. So that, you know, tapping into that, that per- sense of purpose matters. But I think it's even possible to inspire people when we do it through caring. It, as a leader, that you care. You connect with people through caring and a sense of belonging as well as connecting people to purpose, meaning, and contribution. So it can be grand in the sense of there's purpose, meaning, and contribution, but it also can be micro in the sense of there's just my, my immediate supervisor, my colleague, my peer, they care about me. I feel this sense of caring, and that inspires me. I feel a sense of belonging, and that inspires me. And every one of us as leaders can do that. Everyone can inspire. It's a learnable skill. skill through a sense of caring and purpose, as well as connecting people, excuse me, a sense of caring and belonging, as well as connecting people to purpose and to meaning. That's the idea. It's learnable. It's not just for the charismatic. Everyone can inspire. It's a learnable skill. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, you know, like sometimes some of the points that you're bringing up, it's not just for a leader who is a charismatic, evangelical, first class on stage public speaker. When you're talk, the things that you're talking about, if I, if I, if we unpack them a step further, there's sort of two things that I pulled out from that. So you have an organization that has clear purpose, mission, culture, and they actually focus focus on making sure that the the mission statement on the website is more than just the mission statement on the website. It's something that the whole company believes in, buys into, maybe even adds into. But then you yeah. also have at a leadership level, an individual level, you have people that are just being very uh, high EQ, empathetic individuals caring for each other. So it's something that permeates all the way throughout the entire organization. And that's what I guess you're saying when somebody's living and breathing that every single day, that's what actually gets them to go the whatever the 125% or whatever that number was. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. Absolutely. That's it. It's, it's that simple and that difficult. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but I love you know, your point is this is not just for the charismatic. I think too often we've equated inspiration with charisma. Mm-hmm. Thinking you got to be this charismatic soul to inspire people. But think about it. Scott, 
I bet you're like me. I and I bet our listeners and viewers feel the same. I know people, some people who are very charismatic, mm-hmm. but who aren't necessarily inspiring because it's all about them. And you know, they might be charismatic, but I don't know if that inspires me. I know other people who no one would necessarily describe as charismatic but who are extremely inspiring because of who they are, how they care, how they connect, how what they do matters. So let's separate charisma and inspiration. And everyone can inspire, and you named it. You inspire when you connect with people through caring, through a sense of belonging. And then you inspire when you connect people to purpose, to meaning, and to contribution like Pepperdine University is doing and mm-hmm. others are doing. And we can learn to do that as leaders in both fronts. And if all you do as a leader, if all you do is focus on caring for others, caring for people, caring for those that you serve, empathy, compassion, showing that, that actually will inspire them when they sense that you care for them. And I like how Maya Angelou put it, the great poet, civil, civil rights advocate, champion, she said, "People, I've learned that people will forget what you say. They'll even forget what you do, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And when you have a sense of caring that people feel and a sense of belonging, that inspires like, like almost nothing else. And that, that will move the needle. And, and we, we can learn to do that. Now we've... Okay, so now we've sort of understood and we've clarified how organizations can better inspire. But take it back to something that you have been highly focused on, even in your first book. I want to just unpack trust a little bit more. So what does the perfect trust culture organization look like? You see it manifest in the behaviors. You know, people, they talk straight in a way that also demonstrates respect. So it's kind of, it's a, it's kind of a, a rare balance, a unique balance. Straight talk with respect. Because you can be too much straight talk where it's offensive. Mm-hmm. You can have too much respect where no one wants to kind of tell the truth because they don't want to offend. So, you know, you got to be high in straight talk and high in demonstrating respect. You see transparency everywhere. If people make a mistake, they own it. They right the wrong. People, people are loyal to each other, meaning they speak about people as if they were present. So if they have a concern or issue, they go to the person instead of going behind their back. Um, you see people taking responsibility and owning results. You, peop- you see people confronting the reality and take things head on versus kind of skirting it or evading it, kicking the can down the road. People are always clarifying expectations and then holding themselves accountable to those expectations. They hold themselves up accountable first so they can hold others accountable second. You see people listening first and then demonstrating respect for what they hear. You see people keeping the commitments that they make. And then you see people also extending the trust, not only being trustworthy, but being trusting. Now, I just went through a series of behaviors, 13 of them, (laughs) that you see manifest in high trust teams, high trust cultures. And low trust teams, low trust cultures is kind of the contrast, the opposite of, or the counterfeit, where people, rather than talking straight, they're spinning everything. Mm-hmm. And rather than demonstrate respect, respect to everyone, they show respect to some, but not to others. Rather than being transparent, they operate with hidden agendas. So yeah, they're partly open, but they have another agenda behind it. And, and um, they often sweet talk people to their face, but then bad mouth them behind their back. And, and um, they, they often get trapped in activity traps of producing the activity, but not necessarily the result. Maybe they confront issues, but then they're only giving lip service to it because they're still kicking the can down the road. Or maybe they're pointing the finger and blaming people instead of practicing accountability, owning it, taking responsibility. Maybe they listen, but not with the intent to understand. They listen instead with the intent to reply. And they often overpromise and then under deliver. And then the trust that they extend maybe isn't a deep trust. And, and so it's, it feels shallow and, and um, circumstantial. And so 
you know, a variety of different counterfeit things that get in the way of a, of a, of a high trust culture. And so I think you really look at the behavior that gets manifest. And, and I find, you know, I'll just take practicing accountability, owning it and leaders owning it versus finger pointing and, you know, playing the blame game. And I can go into a culture and if I see, I can almost tell by that behavior alone, how much blame game is going on, how much finger pointing and tell you a lot about the level of trust inside of that team, inside of that culture. So you look at the behavior that's, 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 you know, what the fly on the wall would see, not just what they say, but what they do. And, and one point on that, even before we started, we spoke about how important it is to be able to hire the right people. Well, the culture that you're discussing is filled with the right people. And now you going in as a leadership consultant, you probably go into existing cultures where maybe you have a mishmash of the people that exude and, and, and do have the right traits, the high trust traits, the, the people that are really good people that naturally do these things. You have a lot of people that maybe also don't. So this is going to be a two part question. So the first part, and then I'll go into the second. The first part is how do you hire how, when you're hiring these people? How do you figure out that this is the person that has all of these traits? And then I'm going to ask if you already have a team, what are the things that somebody could do to maybe move in the right direction and try and be a slightly better person? But say you're a founder, you're early stage CEO, you're hiring yeah. a team from the ground up. I don't know how to find these people. I don't know what questions to ask in an interview. How do you figure out so that you can find these high trust people that will actually add onto the culture and build this incredible high trust environment? Yeah. Well, you're, you're, what you're wanting to do is you're trying to hire for both a combination of competence, which we're pretty good at, but also of character, which we're not mm -hmm. quite as good at doing. And so that you can, you know, they, you want to make sure we hire people of both competence and character. We become very good at hiring for competence, looking at the skills needed and the like. But we need to become equally good at hiring for character. So that has kind of two halves, the integrity half, the intent half. So on the integrity half, you know, we're looking for people that demonstrate integrity even when it's difficult. So you might ask questions like, can you describe a situation where maybe – you were in an environment or a circumstance where you're trying to get a result and an outcome, but it required to get that result or outcome to achieve what you needed to do. It required you to maybe either violate or go to the very extreme of the, you know, values that you believed in that you stood for, where you felt really kind of maybe close to becoming compromised or maybe actually mm -hmm. becoming compromised. Have you ever had that type of opportunity? And maybe, maybe no one has, but maybe someone has where they, where they ultimately decided that they were going to um, be true to the value, even if it didn't, it meant that they didn't deliver their result. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so that you can kind of see um, when there's a test of integrity, do you still do the right thing or do you kind of go along with the flow and, you know, everyone else is doing it, so... You know, like Warren Buffett said, the five more the five most dangerous words in business, everybody else is doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you might be violating principles or values or, or, you know, what your standards or ethics of some sort. Just because everyone else is doesn't mean you should. So you're trying to assess some measure of that. Another on the on the on the intent side is 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 maybe describe um, a situation where where um, you're trying to see how they work together with others, you know, plays well with others and, and works well so that you can see, is there a focus of me, I mean mine, or is it of we, the team and mutual benefit and, and, um, and bringing people together, teams together. And, you know, it's we, not I, and it's mutual benefit, not self-serving. And, and you're, you know, how you would ask it, might, would depend upon your context, your situation, but you're trying to describe, you know, do behavioral interviewing or describe a situation where you tried to come up with an outcome that was better for everyone, not just for yourself. Mm -hmm. And, and or, or another way of asking this is to try to get into areas of, of vulnerability, of, you know, and, and transparency of, of um, you know, can you describe situations where, where um, you felt inadequate or short of what, needed to happen where you didn't have the answers and how you handled it. And if people respond with, oh, well, I've never felt inadequate and never felt shortchanged and I always had the competence, you know, 
they might be putting on a sense of, I've got to show strength as a leader, when in fact, perhaps the greatest show of strength is that you are vulnerable and that you didn't have the answers in a situation and you said to the team, I don't have the answers, so let's try to create these together and here's how we'll do this and this is why I need you and why I trust you because you're better at this than I am at having knowledge in this area. And I'm not threatened by that. I see that as a strength. And, you know, you're looking for demonstrations of this, this, um, um, this transparency, this openness, this vulnerability. It's interesting, Scott. I was with a, um, a headhunter, um, a senior level executive, you know, search, um, exe- you know, leader who recruits CTOs and CIOs into organizations at the highest level. And he says, look, it's very easy for me to find people with the competence especially in technology. I can find people with competence. I really, my challenge is find people with character that, that show leadership attributes of transparency and vulnerability. Because if someone tries to put on an air that there, there's no flaw, there's no shortcoming, they're perfect, people won't follow that kind of leader because they're not real. Because I look for a leader who's vulnerable, who's authentic, who's real. Yeah, who has shortcomings and weaknesses that they need to build a team around to bring strength to them because that's a leader who others will follow. And the person that comes in and acts perfect, I usually will eliminate early on and recognize that no one's going to follow them. I look for a leader who's authentic and real, vulnerable, transparent. Now, look, that doesn't mean they don't have strengths and competencies and, and that you know you, you can go too far with vulnerability too. Mm-hmm. Renee Brown herself, the, who talks about vulnerability all the time, says vulnerability without boundaries isn't vulnerability. So that doesn't mean there aren't some boundaries. It just means that you're real, you're authentic. Because when you're, when you're appropriately vulnerable, people see you as real, they tend to trust you, they respond back with equal vulnerability, and then together you can create things that you couldn't do otherwise. So you declare your intent, you declare yourself, here's who I am. Here's how I like to work. Here's what works. So, that, you know, that's kind of saying I'm trying to hire people with both competence but also with character. And that combination are people I can build trust with. And, and, that's amazing. And that's, that's, that's kind of on that side. And that's a big area. <laughs> what a was huge your area. The question? It, it, was, it, was, it was just related to the, actually the third stewardship of trust and inspiration because okay. we spoke about trust, spoke about inspiring. But... I didn't speak about modeling yet. And I think modeling yeah. is an interesting point because modeling is I'm in the organization. I want to do better. I'm a leader. I don't know how to go about it. I've sort of operated in maybe a traditional command and control model my entire career. What is the step that I can do? Yes. My main point on modeling is that leaders go first. So, the, so you want to be the first to demonstrate the behavior that you'd like to see. So rather than waiting on everybody else, if we're operating in a culture of spin, you'd be the first to talk straight. Mm-hmm. If we're operating in a culture of everyone's a respecter of persons based upon hierarchy and position, you'd be the first to demonstrate respect to the least of the people, to those that don't have a position or power, but they're a human being. You show respect to that person. If everyone's operating with hidden agendas, you're the first to open your agenda to be transparent, to declare your intent, to declare yourself. You know, you make a mistake, you're the first to apologize or make restitution, even if others are covering up or hiding it. You know, if everyone's bad-mouthing everyone behind their back, you're the first to say, I'm going to go to the person and talk to them. The point is, someone needs to go first. Leaders go first. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It just means that you're doing your best to lead out and to model the behavior you'd like to see in others. And it's interesting. It starts with humility because, um, you know, we need to have both humility and courage as leaders. Humility that there are principles out there that govern and courage to do the right thing even when there's a cost or a consequence and, and, to, and to serve others, not just self-serving courage, but, self, you know, service-oriented courage to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. But it starts with this humility and there's data from LRN, a consultancy firm, that shows that leaders who are humble are 18 times more likely 
to inspire their people than leaders who are not. Now think about that. A lot of leaders are trying to, you know, show that they're competent and capable and they exude arrogance and hubris instead of humility. But does that inspire people? No. Not at all. What, what inspires is someone that's saying, look, I'm humble. I've got to work on this and that. And, and, I'm, and I am working on this, but I'm getting better and, and help me do this. They still have competence. They still, you know, they're not self-denigrating of I'm, I'm not capable. It's just they recognize there's principles out there. And they need a team that all of us is better than just one of us. And, and, um, and they lead that way. That inspires people. You model the behavior. You go first. You're the first to do it. I think it's important to be the first to extend that trust. And, and, um, and, and you know, so that you are trusting and even inspiring because the very act of extending trust also inspires people. So those three stewardships, modeling, trusting, and inspiring, they're all connected. They build on each other. And when you model by extending trust to others, the very act of, of trusting others will inspire them, and being trusted inspires them. So it becomes a virtuous upward spiral where modeling, trusting, and inspiring are connected. But all of us can get better at modeling. And, and I used to, when, I'll tell you what, when I was working on this Trust and Inspire book, Scott, initially the focus was heavily on trust, trusting and inspiring. Because those are, you know, that's in the name, Trust and Inspire. But that, the name is just Trust and Inspire because it was in juxtaposition to command and control. It always had the modeling piece in it. But at first I was kind of just saying, let's just stipulate that. That of course you got to model. But over time I became clear, we can't just stipulate it. We have to become intentional about it. We have to become deliberate about it. Modeling needs to go first. It's someone like Ken Chenault former CEO of American Express, he was such a model at what he taught at American Express about integrity. He modeled it himself that people believed it yeah. and, they, and they were inspired by it and they followed it because he himself was that model. And, and um, leaders like that, you know, that's, we want to follow them. And, and uh, so you can't just stipulate modeling you need to become deliberate and intentional about modeling. And we need to model humility and courage. We need to also model authenticity and vulnerability. Like I mentioned earlier, how we want to hire people who are authentic and vulnerable. And we need to even model empathy and performance. You know, you got you to gotta perform. Any leadership model that doesn't have performance in it is missing something. But the, the idea of empathy... Being paired with performance is really an interesting idea because it's saying, look, you want to help others perform, then understand, understand them, understand their context, their situation, so you can help them succeed. And empathy precedes performance in so many situations, and you get better results when you start with that. So that's the idea. Modeling comes first, and you know, as leaders, we go first. Someone needs to go first. Leaders go first. I love that. Okay, let's um, let's let's do some closing thoughts on on uh, on on the book. I want to get uh, the socials, the website. Where do people go? Because then I want to do a couple of rapid fire to close it out. So anything that we didn't go into that you wanted to bring up, um, but also uh, where should people go to find out more about Franklin Covey, uh, the social handles, all of that. Okay, beautiful. So I would just say this: that you kind of framed it up front, Scott. That. We're moving from command and control to trust and inspire. It's a journey. It's a process. And I'm making the point that for all our progress, we still haven't shifted the paradigm, the mindset. We still too much manage people and things similarly. And trust and inspire is saying you manage things, you lead people. So we need to be good at management. I'm not here to bash management. We need good management. We need good leadership. But we need to be good good at managing things and good at leading people. Too often, we begin to manage people as if they were things because we're so good at management. And, and uh, but if you try to manage people like things, you'll end up with no people and a lot of things because people will go elsewhere. They won't <laughs> want to be a part of it. So manage things, lead people. And, and I also want to say this, that trust and inspire is not the opposite of command and control. It's a third alternative to it. 
So look at it this way. The opposite of command and control is what we might call abdicate and abandon. See, there's no leadership there at all. I'm kind of just saying, oh, it's all hands off. It's a laissez-faire to the extreme. So if command and control is kind of excessively hands-on, abdicate and abandon is kind of all hands off completely without good leadership. Now, trust and inspire is hand in hand. It's, it's really a third alternative. It's still strong. And it's kind of easy to kind of look at this and say, well, don't we in tough environments have to be command and control? And I'm saying, no, you can be trust and inspire. That's still strong. You can be authoritative without being authoritarian. You can be very strong without being forceful. You can be compelling without, and persuasive without being compulsory. You can be, um, you know, in charge and have control without being controlling. So trust and inspire is really a third alternative. It still has high expectations, high accountability. You know, low expectations and low accountability doesn't inspire anyone. So we still kind of are strong. It's just, it's just saying there's a better way to lead in this new world of work that's a third alternative that's hand in hand, that's, that's working with people, not just doing things to them or even for them, but with them. And it inspires them. So it builds a high trust culture that inspires, that enables us to collaborate and innovate, stay relevant in a changing world. That's what we need. And we need to get there. We're on the journey. And I just and, and I try to lay out kind of the paradigm that you start with the belief that there's greatness inside of people. So my job as a leader is to unleash their greatness and, and so forth. A number of fundamental beliefs. And then those three stewardships. You model, you trust, you inspire. So the point is, we need this kind of leadership and we can become these kind of leaders. I think the biggest barrier to becoming a trusted and inspired leader is that we think we already are one. And it's because we say, hey, I'm not command and control. Therefore, I must be trusted and inspired. But there's probably a ways to go still for all of us, myself included, how about we can become better at modeling, at trusting, at inspiring. And then we can become increasingly a model and that model can become a mentor. And we can be the Satya Nadella and the Cheryl Batchelder that become, become the model that can help others do the same as we unleash the greatness inside of our people and our teams everywhere. So it's a journey. This book, Trust and Inspire, is about how to proceed on that journey. I think most people want to be on the journey. I think they are on the journey. This is about getting there and, and getting better at this. And so if you're interested, you can go, you can buy this book anywhere. You can go to the socials, uh, trustandinspire.com. There's stuff on the book and materials. Um, you can follow me on Twitter and on LinkedIn and on Instagram. It's at Stephen M. R. Covey. So Stephen M. R. Covey. Um, and love you to do that, to engage with me and, and really to join me and, and you, Scott, and many others to to be on this, uh, this journey of bringing about a renaissance of trust in our world. We need more trust in our world today, and we need more inspiration, and we need trust and inspire leaders that can do it. So join me and others in bringing about this kind of better world for all of us. I love that. Great. Okay, um, let's do a couple rapid fire to close this out. And you can be as rapid or as not rapid as you'd like. Okay. But <laughs> um, So the biggest challenge that you've overcome in your own personal life my biggest challenge was when we did, we did the merger mm -hmm. and I suddenly found myself not trusted by half the company. And I prided myself on trust. This is where the trust book came from. When I felt misunderstood and half the company didn't trust me and I felt unfairly maligned. And I had to kind of own that, take responsibility, take it head on and learn how to create trust intentionally on purpose. That turned, that crucible, that biggest challenge I've had, turned into my strength, ultimately, in that it gave me the insight and the courage that I earned as I emerged on the other side to say, I want to write about trust. And I've been on both sides of the equation. And it's not fun being on the low trust side. I sure like it being on the high trust side. I had to okay. earn that insight. Um, what keeps you up at night now? What keeps me up at night is figuring out how I can um, best really impact 
my, my, and leverage people with this message and idea so that I'm not just speaking to the choir, so to speak, mm -hmm. but reaching people that maybe wouldn't listen to my message at first glance for whatever reason that, that, um, that I feel like my cynics, my critics, what if I could find a way of showing how this could be relevant to them too? And, and so that I expand my circle of influence and not just speaking to my same audience. And, and so I'm trying to be relevant to people that I haven't been relevant to in the past with showing how this is a better way to lead in a new world. And I think that's why I like to really highlight this is not soft. Mm -hmm. This is strong. It's too easy to label this as soft, but I think this is actually a greater form of strength in leadership today. If you had to pick uh, one person who's been an incredible mentor, obviously there's been many, but pick one person who's been a great mentor to you, what did that person teach you? It was my father. He taught me trust and inspire leadership by who he was. He modeled, he trusted me, he inspired me, brought out the best in me. He saw potential greatness in me that I didn't see in myself. He helped me come to see it in myself. And what I learned from him is that real leadership is seeing and communicating people's worth and potential so clearly that they come to see it in themselves. That's the greatest measure of being a leader is that I can see the potential in others. I can communicate the potential. I can help them come to see it in themselves. My father helped me do that. I saw him do it with others. And I think that's the essence of what this Trust Inspire book is about, is helping leaders do the same for their people. And that is I'm seeing the greatness, communicating the greatness, developing the greatness, and unleashing the greatness that's inside of people. And that is real leadership. I learned it first from my father. What would be a, a favorite source to learn from? A book, a podcast, something that obviously isn't your book that you've found influence your life? Um, well, I mean, it's not my book, but my father's book is a fabulous one. You knew it I is a good one. did that, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. But there have been many, um, many other influencers in my life, um, you know, from Jim Collins and Good to Great and, and love his work and, and, um, and many, many others, Doug Conant, um, and uh, love his work on the leadership blueprint. I wrote the foreword for his book. It's brilliant. He's brilliant. Um, um, many other leaders. I mentioned Cheryl Batchelder, her book, Dare to Serve. Service, you know, servant leadership, that whole approach of philosophy. Trust Inspire really is a way of operationalizing the servant leadership mindset and idea. So many people like that that are out there. Um, I also will say this. I... My, again, I'm giving a little bit bias towards people I'm connected to, but I love my, my son, Stephen H. Covey. He has a podcast called Paradigm Shifting Books, and it's on the top 40 books for any personal or professional development to help shift your life, the paradigm in your life. I think it's wonderful. If you could tell your 20-year-old self one thing, what would it be? Be patient. And, and keep the, the faith and the vision of, of, um, of contribution. And, and, um, and I'll tell you what, you know, I, I felt like I had uh, a lot to do, but I felt I, I, I kind of had to go through Act 1 before I could go to Act 2. And, and um, that I think my Act 2, my, my, my thought leadership work now, is better because I went through Act 1, which is I paid the price and earned the credibility of doing it as a practitioner. And I wanted to kind of skip, but I had to kind of earn that, pay the price. So have the vision, but then be patient, pay the price, work hard. A little bit of Angela Duckworth, the grit, perseverance, and passion, and get through that, and then you'll be in a better place of, of being able to make meaningful contribution. And then last question, what does success mean to you? Success to me means that I'm, I built relationships of trust with all stakeholders. It's not just, it, there's trust there 
in that, and, and that trust includes that I've got character and I've got competence. So I'm delivering results, but I'm doing it the right way, and I care about the people. I'm helping them grow. So yes, you got to, you know, I, the, there's there's trust in the relationships, and and uh, but it's not just with some; it's trying to do it with others because, you know, you might build trust with some people, but then lose it with others. And if you have success and have financial success but you lose the people that are close to you and the relationships with those that are around you that you care about and with family and others, that came at a price that maybe wasn't worth it. And, and so um, I think it, it's, it's uh, relationships of trust. And I also will give one more addition to this. My, I'll use my father's framework for it. He talked about primary greatness and secondary greatness. And... You know, secondary greatness is achievement and, and, and success by traditional standards of impact and this and that. And that's a good thing. Nothing wrong with it. But primary greatness is, is all about character, about who you are. It's about those relationships of trust. And that that is really even deeper. Nothing wrong with secondary greatness achievement. But we want to make sure we always lead out with the primary greatness, with our character who we are and with our relationships and and building that so that that always is at the forefront, that it's about purpose, it's about meaning, it's about contribution. Life is about contribution, not accumulation. And contribution is primary greatness. Accumulation could be secondary greatness. And I don't want to downplay that secondary greatness can be good. You want to make, you know, you want to do well in your work, in your profession. But make sure it's always about because you want to make a difference. You want to matter. You want to contribute. I think if we keep that primary greatness in mind, con contribution and character, that will help us in the other things that, that also are important to us, you know, to, contri to, to uh, do well and to achieve. That's good. Let's keep it through the lens of contributing, contribution.